For most people, the name Polaroid is synonymous with instant photography. Seemingly magical cameras which could produce photographs not within days or weeks, but in the moment, within seconds, at the touch of a button. This camera here, the Polaroid SX70, was one of the most groundbreaking and commercially successful consumer technology products of the mid 20th century. It was also, to coin a phrase from our modern digital age, a disruptive product, which turned the entire photography world upside down. In this video today, I'm going to share with you the backstory of the SX70, the rise and fall of Polaroid, and the life and career and contributions of its founder and creator, Edwin Land. How's it going everyone? My name is Todd Domini. I make videos here on YouTube about photography. I was inspired to make this video about Polaroid because this camera, this actual camera that you see sitting here in front of me, belonged to my mom and dad in the 1970s. It was the camera they used to document every family birthday, holiday, and vacation. And ever since, this camera has been sitting on the top shelf in my mother's closet. And she recently came across it and was just thinking about getting rid of it, but thought she would hold on to it for me just in case. And now I am the owner of this classic Polaroid SX70. Now, ever since I received this SX-70, I've become somewhat engrossed in the story of Polaroid, the invention of instant photography, and the career of its founder, Edwin Land. Land, of course, became a household name for inventing instant photography. But his contributions actually go back much further. All the way back, in fact, to when Land was just a kid at summer camp. Now the story goes that one day while at camp, a counselor shared a unique crystal with Land and his fellow campers. That crystal was an Iceland spar. The counselor demonstrated for the campers how the crystal, when held at just the right angle, eliminated the sun's glare and reflections on hard surfaces. Knowing the attention span of most kids, the counselor's demonstration of the Iceland Spar was most likely a short-lived curiosity for all the other campers. But for Land, it became an obsession. Land was fascinated by light, optics, and the unusual filtering effects of this crystal. And so following summer camp, he started experimenting as a teenager trying to recreate the behavior of the Iceland Spar for use in a commercial product. And incredibly, after years of experimenting, at the young age of 19, Land invented, you guessed it, the Polarizer. Transparent sheets embedded with thousands of tiny crystals which could split and bend light, just like that Iceland Spar he saw at summer camp. At the recommendation of a friend, Land named his invention Polaroid. Land's polarizer sheets ended up in consumer sunglasses, in filters made by Kodak, in goggles used by American pilots during World War II, and even a specially designed train car named the Copper King, where passengers could rotate their windows to get a clear view of the landscape passing by outside. These windows were, in effect, giant circular neutral density filters, just like the ones we use today for photography and for capturing video. But where Land really wanted Polaroid to be implemented was in automobiles. Because in those days, headlights were dimmer to prevent drivers from being blinded by oncoming cars. It's something we take for granted today and, and really don't even think about anymore, but back then, accidents caused by headlights were actually quite frequent. By polarizing those headlights and windshields, however, headlights could then be brighter and then driving at night would be safer. Detroit, however, didn't see the point in implementing Polaroid because in their opinion, they could sell cars with or without Land's technology because demand was so high. And by increasing the cost of each vehicle by adding Polaroid, they would just be reducing their profits. 
So Edwin Land tried to get the United States government on board to persuade the auto companies to adopt Polaroid in the public interest, but ultimately he wasn't successful. Now, if the polarizer had been Land's only invention, it would have been a successful life by the measure of most people. But Land didn't stop there. The story goes that after failing to get the auto companies to implement Polaroid in their headlights and their windshields, Land went on vacation with his family to Santa Fe, New Mexico at the end of 1943. And one day while on vacation, he was taking photos of his daughter using a traditional film camera. His daughter asked him, why did she have to wait weeks to see the photos he was taking of her? Inspired, Land spent the rest of the afternoon sketching the camera and the film, which might someday make his daughter's request a reality. Now, how true that story actually is, is anyone's guess. Because in addition to being a brilliant scientist and entrepreneur, Land also had an unusual knack for storytelling, showmanship, and stagecraft. However, inspiration came to Edwin Land in 1943. Five years later, in 1948, Polaroid would begin selling the world's first peel-apart instant photography camera, the Model 95. introduces an economy model of the famous color pack camera for half the price of the original. Same great film. Same fast loading. Same electric eye. Yet it's half the price of the original model. You get the same beautiful color prints in 60 seconds, black and white in 10, in the same big size. Yet it's half the price of the original model. Isn't it your turn to own a Polaroid color pack camera? Now, in case you're wondering what Kodak thought about Polaroid and Land's invention, Kodak was actually a partner in its creation. Polaroid wasn't able to manufacture their peel-apart film at scale, so Kodak, not seeing instant photography and Land's camera as a threat to their own film and camera business, helped engineer and manufacture film for Polaroid's revolutionary camera. But their relationship wouldn't last. For whatever reason, whether it was pride, hubris, or even intentional for that matter, Polaroid didn't publicly acknowledge Kodak's role in their groundbreaking peel-apart instant photography product, an exclusion which infuriated Kodak executives. And to make matters worse, Kodak then seeing the opportunity and seeing Polaroid's success in the market, they wanted in on the instant photography business, but were blocked by Polaroid and Land's arsenal of patents, which at that time numbered in the hundreds. Eventually, Land would agree to license Polaroid's peel-apart film system to Kodak, but the deal was actually worthless because Land and his team of engineers were secretly working on a new product, which would effectively replace the entire peel-apart film business. That product was the Polaroid SX70. Edwin Land envisioned a new camera, which would offer instant photographs like earlier Polaroid cameras, but would do so in a revolutionary way. He was, in a sense, reinventing his own invention. Instead of a bulky, awkward, heavy camera which required its users to peel apart film at just the right moment for a proper exposure, the SX70 would be a camera which produced instant self-developing photographs, dry to the touch, with nothing to peel apart. And most dramatically, the camera would be small, collapsible, and fit comfortably in a jacket pocket. They were a long way from the dream which I used to talk about then of being able to take a wallet out of my pocket and perhaps open the wallet, press a button, close the wallet, 
and have the picture. But for this camera, Polaroid was on their own. Kodak would no longer help Polaroid manufacture film, so Land and company had to figure out how to do it themselves. And the vast building coming in below is our new camera factory, the first we have ever built. Land gambled nearly a billion dollars in pursuit of the ultimate instant photography system, which it's worth pointing out, he did so without conducting any market research to validate whether people would actually buy the camera. It was a bold, arguably reckless attitude, which would later influence Steve Jobs, who once was famously quoted as saying, we don't do market surveys, we create the markets with our products. But getting the SX-70 to market required more than just money, hubris, and vision. It would take tenacity, drive, experimentation, and faith in the scientific process, all of which had been part of Land's entire life, going back to when he was a teenager in the lab, working for hours, day after day, month after month, trying to create the polarizer. In 1972, the SX-70 was born. And now, a compact, folding, electronically controlled, motor-driven, single-lens reflex camera capable of focusing from infinity down to 10 inches has been developed to exploit integral self-processing film units, which when exposed are automatically ejected from the camera with no parts to peel or discard, and whose final images emerge without timing in daylight where the viewer can see them materialize within the same transparent, protective plastic cover through which the film was originally exposed. Initially offered in limited quantities in only a handful of markets, the cameras quickly sold out. There were some early bugs with regard to the batteries not lasting with some of the film packs as they sat on store shelves, but some of those issues and other problems with the manufacturing process were sorted out, and by a year later, Polaroid was selling millions of these SX-70 cameras and their proprietary patented film packs. Remarkable, Polaroid's SX-70 sonar. A motor-driven, single-lens reflex camera that simply does the impossible. Sound waves focus it automatically, so you can spend your time shooting instead of focusing. Everything is electronically controlled to give you exquisite photographs in minutes. Polaroid's SX-70 sonar. The finest instant camera ever made. But the camera was not simply a business success for Polaroid or the ultimate culmination of Land's vision from three decades prior, but a product which would introduce photography to millions of people and forever change the industry. Remarkably, and perhaps most disappointing of all, the SX-70 was also the beginning of the end. In the years following, Polaroid would continue to iterate, optimize, and expand their instant photography products with cheaper versions of the SX-70 and additional technological refinements. But then Polaroid would become mired in a lawsuit with Kodak. Reason being, Kodak had spent years trying to invalidate a number of Polaroid's instant photography patents around the world hoping to carve out just enough legal wiggle room for them to offer their own instant photography camera and film. Ignoring Polaroid's threats about the hundreds of instant photography patents they held, Kodak went to market anyway with the Kodak EK6, the very definition of a Me Too product with a design that Polaroid executives jokingly referred to when they first looked at it as a parking meter. The magic of Christmas comes to life in instant color by Kodak. The EK6, the only motorized instant camera that gives you this. Bright, brilliant color by Kodak. You can capture all the enchantment and color of Christmas instantly. There's instant color, and there's instant color by Kodak. Look what Santa Claus brought. As a result, Polaroid and Kodak went to court, and 15 years later, Polaroid won. Kodak had to pay Polaroid a billion dollars in damages, and most dramatically, and perhaps humiliating of all, 
remove their instant photography cameras and film from store shelves around the world. The 11 o'clock report. And tonight it's a shutter and film problem for Kodak. A U.S. district judge has given Kodak until tomorrow to get out of the instant photography business. Nightwatch 6 reporter Bob Sokoler is in the newsroom now with what the ruling will mean to Kodak instant camera owners. Jail Court Justice Lewis Powell says Kodak must stop selling its instant cameras and instant film tomorrow. That means instant headaches for the thousands of Central Floridians who own a Kodak instant camera. The film supply is gone. But in the end, this whole court case was mostly all for naught. The instant photography business Polaroid had fought so hard to protect, and Kodak was spending billions of dollars trying to get in on, would in short order become irrelevant and obsolete as would both companies. The reason? Digital photography. In the fall of 1981, during the trial between Kodak and Polaroid, Sony's chairman and co-founder Akio Morita came to America to preview their pioneering work in digital imaging. 17 minutes before uh, 8 o'clock right now, and Sony has done it again. This is the latest in camera technology. It is called a Mavica. That stands for Magnetic Video Camera. It records images on a magnetic disc, and then those are transmitted on television. And here to talk about that this morning is the man who spells Sony, Akio Morita. He is the founder of that worldwide corporation. This becomes a kind of portable television camera with still pictures, doesn't it? Yes. Actually, this, basically, this is the same as a video camera, television camera, but uh, this is a uh, record, uh, recording tape. Instead of tape, we use a disc, magnetic disc. So on this disc, we can take a 50 still picture. Instant pictures? Instant pictures. And they're what, transmitted through this kind of device? Yes, this is a small viewer which uh, can be connected to your television. Neither Kodak nor Polaroid were interested in what Sony was developing, which is remarkable in hindsight because Digital imaging could solve the same problems Polaroid was trying to solve throughout its own history. Instant photography, in the moment, without film development. By 1991, following the landmark court case of Polaroid against Kodak, Edwin Land passed, and his company, Polaroid, would begin sliding into oblivion. It's remarkable now to think, had Edwin Land seen the opportunity and promise of digital photography, history could have turned out very different. But in the 90s, Polaroid was no longer the disruptor. They were now the business to be disrupted by someone smaller, more nimble, and imaginative. Polaroid's conservative approach and blind faith in their instant photography business would be their own downfall. Ten years after Edwin Land died, Polaroid declared bankruptcy in 2001, and by 2008, would cease producing instant film. But as you probably know, that's not the end of the Polaroid story. Because immediately following Polaroid's 2008 announcement, an independent Dutch company named The Impossible Project was formed by a handful of people to create their own instant Polaroid film to help fill the gap that Polaroid was going to create by getting out of the business. In the years since, Impossible Project would acquire more of Polaroid's assets, eventually rebranding themselves Polaroid Originals, and then this year, in March of 2020, another rebrand to simply Polaroid. And so today, Polaroid lives on with colorful instant cameras for consumers who want that classic, nostalgic look in their photography. The story of Polaroid for me has it all. It is a remarkable case study of business, consumer technology, art, design, engineering, science, and of course, photography as well. It's so worth exploring and reading more about, which I would recommend doing by picking up a triumph of genius, Edwin Land, Polaroid, and the Kodak Patent War by Ronald K. Firestein, who, by the way, was one of the attorneys representing Polaroid in their historic court case against Kodak. It's a big book. I mean, it's nearly 600 pages in length, but 
I think it's the, the definitive history of, uh, of Polaroid, of instant photography, and of the life and career of Edwin Land. I think it's also especially interesting if you have um, a technical interest in learning more about um, you know, the science behind instant photography, some of the experiments that, they, that, that were done at Polaroid, all the patents that they filed, some of which were used and some of which were not. If you're looking for a long read and you're looking for something to you know, really wrap your head around and get into, I think it's an awesome book. When we started doing the SX-70 camera, he said, oh, this is the camera that I wanted to make back in 1948. Well, he wouldn't stop until he saw every little piece. And he would get so emotional about uh, the smallest detail, you, you, you couldn't imagine that he would ever know anything about it. And yet he would. And he had the uncanny ability to look at solutions to a problem orthogonally, to look at them from a different viewpoint than most people would. Just constantly uh, testing. Yeah. And testing the opposite of what you believe. In the labs, there were always dozens or hundreds of things going on that, that land would kind of plant like seeds and then come back and harvest later to bring together in the new products. He was kind of a Ulysses in science. I mean, it, it was the acceleration of the journey that was as much fun as getting there. I'm awful glad that I had the chance to be able to work for Dr. Land. That he was a real compassionate man that you felt was a friend and you wanted to work to help him achieve what he was trying to finish. And I don't know, I worked there 37 years and enjoyed every minute of it, so very glad that I did work at Polaroid through the whole exciting buildup of all the different products, from the sepia to black and white to color. It, it was fun, I enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you would like to keep in touch in the future and be notified of future videos, please remember to subscribe to this channel as well. It really does help. And I know, I know I've said it before and you hear other people saying it, but it really does help with the, with the growth of a channel and, uh, and it makes a big difference. So I would appreciate it. That's it for me this week. Thanks for being here and uh, I'll see you next time.